Welcome to my channel. On this video, we are going to review ovarian tumors, both benign and malignant ones. Just like I did in the breast tumors video, I'm going to try to clarify what's the difference between each type and how to make a sense of the huge multitude of tumors. With ovarian tumors, even more than breast tumors, it's easy to get lost amongst the many subtypes of cancer and other tumors. So, primarily, we have to understand what are the main groups and then have a brief idea of what makes each of these characteristic. Before we begin, a disclaimer, this video is meant only as a review and is not intended for medical use. If you believe you might have ovarian cancer, please seek your physician. If you believe one of your patients may have ovarian tumors, please check the latest guidelines before making a decision. So, rather than starting by classifying the tumors as benign or malignant, usually ovarian tumors are classified according to their origin. Often, tumors from a particular origin, for example, serous tumors, can be both benign or malignant. So, let's start by taking a closer look at our friend here. Here you can see a slice of a follicle. You can see the oocyte right in the middle, surrounded first by the granulosa cells and then by the tica cells. The reason I've drawn this is because ovarian tumors can arise from four different origins, three local or metastasis, which will have profoundly different presentations. So, we can have ovarian tumors arising from the surface of the ovary, which will generate surface epithelial tumors. We can have ovarian tumors arising from the granulosa and tica cells, which will generate sex cord stromal tumors. And we can have them arising from the oocyte or egg itself, generating germ cell tumors. We can also have metastasis to the ovaries. So, right there we have the four main groups of ovarian cancers according to where they originate from, from which cells. Surface epithelial tumors are easily the most common, accounting for 60 to 70% of all ovarian tumors. Then, germ cell tumors account for 15 to 20%. And finally, sex cord stromal tumors correspond to 3 to 5%. So let's start with the surface epithelial tumors. Surface epithelial tumors of the ovary derive from silomic epithelium. Therefore, they can differentiate between many silomic structures. They can present as serous, resembling the fallopian tube. They can differentiate along the lines of the cervix presenting as mucinous, they can differentiate in the same way as the endometrium, presenting as endometrioid, the one pretty much no one ever mentions, even though it's actually more common than some of the other ones, the clear cell, in case it decides to differentiate as mesonephros, and finally, a rare presentation, but often talked about, the Brenner tumor, if it decides to differentiate like erophilium. So, we have these five possible ways in which the tumors can differentiate. Additionally, they can be classified as benign, in which case they are a cystadenoma, or malignant, in which case they are a cystadenocarcinoma. Typically, a benign cyst presents as unilocular, without internal divisions, with thin walls and only fluid on the inside, whereas a malignant cyst will usually differentiate from the benign one through its thick wall, multiple internal subdivisions, with thick septa, a heterogeneous presentation, and the presence of large solid parts. The benign one is typically smooth and multilocular, and the malignant one is typically irregular, multiloculated, and with large solid parts. Also, just like we see in breast tumors, the benign ones are more common in premenopausal women, while the malignant ones are more common in postmenopausal women. 
The tumor can also be borderline, which means basically it's not as malignant as a malignant tumor, however, has a worse prognosis than a benign tumor. The serial cysts are filled with clear watery fluid, can often be bilateral, which is a difference from the other ones, and often presents with samoma bodies, which is a type of dystrophic calcification, that is, deposition of calcium following local necrosis. You could remember it, for example, with the many C's, and here I'm going to take a license to write serous with C, but you could say that the serous cysts have ciliated cells and dystrophic calcification. Calcification also starts with C for the samoma bodies. It's also interesting to note that the BRCA1 or breast cancer 1 gene is associated in the over precisely with the serous cystadenocarcinoma, as well as the serous carcinoma of the fallopian tube. Now, this isn't really a coincidence, is it? It's associated with the serous carcinoma of the fallopian tube and with the serous cystadenocarcinoma of the ovary, since the serous presentation in the ovary resembles exactly the fallopian tubes. The mucinous cysts quite obviously are filled with mucous material. The endometrioid tumors are associated with endometrial cancer in up to 15 to 30 percent of cases. The clear cell tumor is rarely mentioned, and the Brenner tumor is famous for the Walford cells, which are quite similar to erythelial cells. So we could just remember that. Brenner is like the bladder. Brenner, bladder. Since the call to fame of this tumor is precisely the fact it resembles transitional epithelium. Now, as a whole, surface epithelial tumors are derived from coelom and therefore they will usually metastasize by seeding the peritoneal cavity or coelomic dissemination and they present with elevated CA125. So now onwards to the sex cord stromal tumors. The sex cord stromal tumors are pretty intuitive. You can have tumors arising from the sex cord cells, such as a granulosa chica cell tumor, which will produce estrogens and therefore can cause precocious puberty in young girls, metrorrhagia in fertile women or postmenopausal bleeding in postmenopausal women and is often differentiated by its Kohl-Exner bodies. You could just remember instead of Kohl-Exner, you could think Kohl-Extrogen bodies, which would mean that if you are going to call more extrogen to come, then it's an estrogen producing tumor and it must arise from the granulosa and chica as it's working pretty much like a normal ovary. So you can find call exner bodies in a granulosa chica cell tumor. Since they have the same embryonal origin, however, these tumor cells could also differentiate into the male counterparts and form a Sertoli Lydic cell tumor. Then, it will have the rank crystals characteristic from lytic cells and it will be an androgen producing tumor, which can cause virilization. Alternatively, you could also have a fibroma and then we have the stromal part, a benign tumor of fibroblasts, although it usually presents associated with tica cells as a tichoma fibroma. Now, this tumor is particularly known for a condition known as Mike's syndrome, which is essentially a fibroma associated with pleural effusion and ascites. The mechanism itself is not completely known, however, since it's a pretty unique presentation, an ovarian tumor associated with pleural effusion and ascites, it's often asked by boards and other tests. 
Finally, depending on how you want to classify it, we also have a four tumor, a gonadoblastoma, which combines characteristics from both the sex cord stromal tumors and the germ cell tumors. I like to think that it has gonad in its name, and therefore it's most likely representative of the entire gonad or the entire ovary. Well, not quite, but since it has gonad in the name, I like to think that it has portions of at least two tissues. What actually happens is that it's a combination between a dysgerminoma, a germ cell tumor, and another sex cord stromal tumor, such as the ones we have seen. And it's malignant. And so, finally, we get to the germ cell tumors. Here again, we have five different kinds of germ cell tumors. Germ cell tumors are particularly common in reproductive age women. The first one is the C6 teratoma or dermoid cyst. What's the difference between teratoma or dermoid cyst? Well, historically there was a debate whether a dermoid cyst had only two origins of tissues, whereas the teratoma had three, but usually nowadays they are used interchangeably. A teratoma is a tumor that has ectodermal, mesodermal and endodermal tissues. It's bilateral in 10% of cases, and one of its most peculiar presentations is the struma ovaria, which is a teratoma that has a high amount of functioning thyroid tissue and therefore can cause hyperthyroidism. Teratoma is the classical tumor with teeth and hair and all other kinds of structures. Teratus from the Greek means monster. While 99% of teratomas in women are benign, we can still have tissue within the teratoma malignizing. That's called somatic malignancy. And the most common is the squamous cell carcinoma of the skin in the skin present in the teratoma. It's also bilateral in 10% of cases. The embryonal carcinoma is pretty aggressive and has early metastasis since its embryonal cells are pretty immature. And the yolk sac tumor or endodermal sinus tumor is most known because of its occurrence in children. Contrary to most ovarian tumors, which happens in older women, its mean average age of presentation is 23 years old. It's also known by its Schiller-Duval bodies, which are glomeruloid-like structures. The yolk sac tumor microscopically resembles glomeruli. Since it's also known for elevating alpha fetoprofen, you could remember, for example, that there is a fetus and you are collecting a sac full of glomerulus to gift the fetus when he or she is born if it helps you in any way. So you would have a sac of glomerulus to give the fetus a yolk sac tumor with elevated alpha fetoprofen and glomeruloid formations or Schiller-Duval bodies. The dysgerminoma is the female analog to the seminoma, which you could probably figure out by the name, since they both end with the same six letters, minoma, and is commonly associated with the strict ovaries of Turner syndrome, presenting with elevated lactate dehydrogenase. And finally, choriocarcinoma is a highly malignant tumor composed of cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts, but with absent villi. It's pretty much a tumor that resembles the placenta, and therefore it has a hematogenous spread and presents with elevated beta-HCG. Just as you would expect from a normal placenta, it secretes beta-HCG, and just as you would expect from the normal placenta, unfortunately, it's really good at finding blood vessels to mingle with. At last, we have the least common kind of tumor in the ovaries, which are metastases from other organs. The most famous one 
is easily the Krokenberg tumor. Now, pretty much everyone has heard about the Krokenberg tumor and its characteristic signet ring cells. However, as much as everyone knows about the Krokenberg tumor origin in the stomach, it can also be a metastasis from the breast, both stomach and some types of breast cancer can produce signet ring cells. So a Krokenberg tumor does not necessarily indicate a metastatic gastric neoplasia. Finally, you can also have metastasis from a mucus producing tumor of the appendix through seeding of the peritoneal cavity, which can lead to the condition known as pseudomyxoma peritoneae when a lot of mucus from mucus-producing cancerous cells accumulates inside the abdomen. Metastatic tumor to the ovary from the appendix, therefore, is usually mucinous carcinoma of the appendix. Thank you for watching this video and sharing your time with me. I hope I may have clarified some things about ovarian cancer for you. And if you are interested, please check out the other videos. Thank you for your attention. And until the next topic.